Good morning, I am Maggie Moore. I'm a senior planner in the growth management division at PSRC. Um, and today we are excited to uh, present on climate as part of our Passport to 2044 series. This is a series is in partnership between the Puget Sound Regional Council and the Washington State Department of Commerce. We are really excited to have you here. Um, this is one topic in our series of events. So we had a kickoff on comprehensive planning on June 15th. I assume many people on this call attended that one, but if you didn't, the recording is up and on our website. The great overview from PSRC, Commerce, as well as MRSC. Today's session on climate is the first of our topical sessions, and we have a lot more to come throughout the year. So the economic development session on September 7th, registration is now open for that. For our following sessions, we don't have registration open yet, but it will be coming soon. So if you're not currently on our email list, um, let us know and we can get you on that so you know when those sessions open. Um, today's session on climate, after some welcoming remarks and introduction from myself and Paul Ingram, we will have a presentation from Kelly McGurdy on PSRC's work in support of climate and comprehensive plans. We'll pass it over to the Washington State Department of Commerce to talk about their work as well as having a local perspective from the city of Tumwater and another region from the Thurston Regional Planning Council to really talk about the work that they're doing. And then we will open it up to Q&A. So you are all here today, but if you weren't or you need to drop off early, the recording for today's meeting and all of the presentations will be shared after the meeting. So you can share it with others or come back to it for reference. We also have a Q&A box for you. So if you have questions during any of the presentations, please ask them. Each of the presenters will be trying to leave a little bit of time after their presentations to go through and answer any of those questions. But we also have a larger block of 15 minutes at the end of the session today to answer questions. And anything we don't get to, we'll try to answer afterwards, or you can always reach out to any of us with those questions. So I am, uh, and then after the session as well, we are going to have a brief Title VI survey asking some demographic questions. This will be an anonymous survey. So we hope you can stay on and answer those questions at the end of today's meeting. So I'm going to pass it over to Paul Ingram, who's our Director of Growth Management Planning. He's going to talk more about PSRC's role in supporting local comprehensive plans and Vision 2050. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Welcome, everybody. We're glad that you're here. Um, Maggie, great introduction to the webinar series. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, what many of you are here to working on and thinking about, which is this 2024 Conference of Plan update. Um, we understand there may be a few people from outside the Puget Sound region, and maybe you're looking at your update for the subsequent years. But um, by and large, probably people from within the region really focused on this upcoming update and um, and what you need to do for it. Um, so we want to talk a little bit just generally about the resources, um, support that's available either from PSRC or from Commerce or from other agencies. And um, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit before we dive into all the climate stuff. Uh, Maggie, next slide. So... Vision 2050 was adopted a couple of years ago. Um, it's an update from Vision 2040. Many of you were familiar with that. And it continues that kind of Growth Management Act theme of trying to uh, coordinate growth into uh, appropriate growth patterns that take advantage of our transportation system, that work to enhance our communities and protect the environment. Uh, but it also puts some new emphasis in a few different areas. Even though housing was already important, um, it really strengthened uh, that as aspect of housing, and you'll hear more about that in future webinars. And um, specifically for today, it created a new chapter on climate change and um, aligned itself with the Clean Air Agency's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. Um, it also expanded, while we had some policies on climate change, it expanded those somewhat and added some policies about resilience, and we'll talk about those today as well. So. Um, Climate change, resilience, greenhouse gas emissions were all really um, strengthened both within that climate change chapter and in other parts of the plan as well. So, um, so that's a, a key part of Vision 2050 um, and the new multi-county planning policies. 
Maggie, next slide. So one of the key things that we do is review local plans. So as you finish your plans at the end of 24, um, you'll submit them to Commerce and to PSRC. Uh, we review and certify those plans and that qualifies jurisdictions for transportation funding. Um, to help you through that process, we've updated our, what we call the plan review manual. Um, sometimes we would call that the checklist, but the manual is actually a broader guidebook about how to go through the plan update process, what's in Vision 2050, what we look for during that review. What it, it essentially takes those policy areas, areas and boils them down to, uh, these are the types of things that we look for in each plan update. Um, you have the link there, and if you download the presentation afterwards, those links will work. Um, you can see here how some of that uh, uh, review manual is organized. Um, it talks about some of the tools that can be used, things to use early in the planning process um, as you're reviewing your policies, um, and then as you complete it to be able to check off that you've been able to do that. Um, a little bit of symbology in there to make sure that you catch things that are new and different from last time that you might not have been aware of before. So hopefully those are helpful. Um, and again, those are posted online. Uh, just in a real quick summary, thinking of some of the things that we look for, um, the review from Commerce is a little bit different from the review from PSRC. Uh, Commerce looks more broadly at a conference plan and perhaps really focuses on, are you completing your core requirements and you're completing them on time? Uh, PSRC looks for things that are really focused on relationship to transportation. Um, so that includes things like the land use assumptions, because that really drives transportation demand. It includes your transportation project list, but it also includes things like uh, aspects of climate um, that are a direct result of transportation. So uh, we may not look at all the things that you do regarding climate in as much detail, but it is something that we want to make sure that you're addressing the, the climate impacts and resilience aspects of the transportation system. Uh, a little bit more about resources. So we have a couple slides here. We have both a range of different publications from uh, a summary of Vision 2050 in that cute booklet you see in the corner, um, a handout about the plan review process, um, some other recorded webinars as they, as they are completed. So those are online. And then the next slide, uh, it, we also have specific guidance tools. So actually for this one, we're developing a climate change guidance uh, document that will help you if you're working on either preparing a comprehensive plan element on climate or integrating it into your plan. And if you're working on how to implement some of those policies, maybe you already have some policies, but you're thinking about how do we implement that and make that um, part of the city's actions, um, that guidance document might be able to help point you in the right direction. Uh, there are lots and lots of different sources of guidance out there, um, especially on climate. So ours tries to both kind of orient you to uh, Vision 2050 aspects, things that are appropriate for cities, things like land use and transportation that you work on, um, and then also provides a lot of linkage and connection to other things. So. Um, we're right in the middle of updating our website, so that's a, it's kind of an odd timing for us with this webinar, um, but you might go to our website and see the old site, or you might see the new site, kind of depending on your computer and the servers out there, um, and in the next day or two, we should have that climate guidance in a draft form up and posted, as well as these other ones that you see uh, underlined here, and then as we continue to do some of these webinars uh, this uh, summer and fall, you'll see some more uh, guidance documents published. So hopefully all those are helpful to you as you go through. Um, in some ways, all this information might add to that overwhelming. We had that polling question, like, are you excited or overwhelmed? In some ways we recognize they kind of add to that overwhelming aspect, um, but hopefully they're also valuable resources so that as you plan out your project and you work through your comp plan update, you have these things that you can turn to. Um, so you don't have to remember everything that you hear today. You'll be able to come back um, through our site, Commerce's website, and also the uh, Municipal Research Service Center website are three great starting points. 
All right, Maggie. So that's it for our introduction. I'm going to turn it over to Kelly McGurdy, and we'll start to dive into um, our thoughts and guidance on climate change. Terrific. Thank you, Paul. Let me pull up my set of slides here. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Really, uh, really excited to be here today and, and share with you our thoughts and how we've developed the, the guidance document on climate. Maggie and Paul just gave a, a really great um, overview and introduction, and I'm just going to maybe go a wee bit deeper um, on some of the comments that they made related to climate and also how we approach the guidance document. So um, Paul laid this out beautifully. Um, climate is a key policy theme in Vision 2050. Uh, he mentioned that uh, Vision 2050 is aligned with the current adopted goals of the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. And there are policies and actions uh, addressing both how to reduce emissions, uh, as well as preparing for impacts from climate change. And this really covers um, so many different uh, sectors and topics. Um, the Vision 2050 also calls on PSRC to do uh, some work, to keep, to keep doing work, and I'm going to touch a little bit on that as well in terms of how those are some, some resources that are being built that hopefully will help all of you as you do your work as well. So as I mentioned, the policy climate touches so many different sectors, so many different topics. And policies in Vision 2050 also kind of acknowledge that, as, as Paul said, that there's a climate change chapter, but there are also policies throughout some of the other sectors that really relate, and we try to capture those and address those in the guidance document as well. So just kind of a, a broad summary of how climate is addressed in Vision. There are policies that, that address preserving our natural environment. There are certainly policies related to resilience, both resilience of our infrastructure, whether that's transportation or uh, utilities or other infrastructure, as well as resilience of our communities. There are policies that are tied to climate that are relevant that relate to how we all coordinate and cooperate and work together. There are policies um, across a lot of different spectrums, but um, also addressing protecting uh, vulnerable populations and areas that might be disproportionately impacted by climate. And then there's also those, those policies that address the, redu the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And that could be through a variety of things. And these are just a few examples, looking for alternative fuels and energy sources, not just from transportation, but from the built environment. Uh, looking for reducing the energy use in buildings through um, development of green buildings and conservation, as well as reducing overall vehicle miles traveled. So PSRC has um, included and addressed climate uh, throughout our planning work. Um, it's certainly an emphasis in both Vision 2050 as well as our regional transportation plan. And Paul mentioned this a moment ago uh, about transportation and land use. Our work and our expertise really focuses on transportation and land use. And you'll see that um, uh, theme throughout uh, Vision as well as the regional transportation plan. For many years, our agency has had an adopted four-part greenhouse gas strategy, and you can see those four parts on the slides here. Um, again, really leaning into the, the, um, the areas of influence that we have here as an agency, as well as our expertise. So land use, supporting the Vision 2050 growth strategy, providing tra multimodal transportation choices, extensive expansion of our integrated regional transit network, Looking at um, user fees, this is more specific to transportation, as well as technology, as we mentioned, transitioning to um, uh, zero emission, both in the transportation field, but also looking at alternative fuels elsewhere. Um, and, and again, as, as we mentioned, the regional growth strategy in Vision 2050 is really a key element of our four-part strategy and a key element that can help us to address climate change. Um, it really focuses growth in, in um, compact, walkable communities with a transit-focused growth strategy, as you can see. And it's also preserving our, our natural environment, which also uh, can provide benefits to addressing climate change and, and uh, improving resilience. So what I'd like to do is move into, that was kind of a, a broad introduction to how climate is just kind of captured, incorporated in Vision 2050 and our work here at PSRC and the, that importance again of, of the transportation land use connection. 
But I want to move now into how we've approached the guidance document um, and, it's, and, and how we're um, hopefully providing some better information for you all and resources to help you, uh, as you as you incorporate this into your comprehensive plans. So as we've mentioned, um, so I guess one important feature is, is to acknowledge that the guidance document that you'll be receiving as a, as a draft shortly, this is not a Climate 101, this is not a, a comprehensive step-by-step -step guide. It really is resources and examples um, and, and hopefully some guidance and helpful resources to you, but it's really specifically tied to the Vision 2050 climate-related policies and actions. So we've tried to provide some best practices and examples, provide some clarifications um, where that might be helpful and really summarize those themed climate policies throughout the document, provided resources and links that we thought might be helpful, um, and also acknowledging that there are a range of opportunities. There, this is not a one size fit, fits all. We recognize that every community has unique needs and unique resources. And so we tried to tailor the guidance to acknowledge that and really meet jurisdictions where they are in terms of available resources, what their needs are, as well as the level of effort. Another thing we wanted to do is acknowledge that there's a lot of great work already going on. And so the guidance document, again, tying back to what are the what are what does Vision 2050 say? What are those different policies and actions? How are they grouped together? But really acknowledging that there's a lot of work that's already moving forward that's that's um, really valuable and can help to address climate. Um, some examples just even within a, a, your own jurisdiction, working with your manage, emergency management departments, working with your public, crossing the aisle between public works and planning. There's a lot of resources and a lot of work that, you know, connecting those dots and making those, those um, uh, connections and leveraging existing work can really be valuable as you're trying to uh, address and improve upon climate. There's also examples that we tried to provide where there are some existing partnerships and, uh, whether that's internal partnerships or partnerships with other organizations that can really serve as good models to address some of the, uh, and make progress on some of the, the policies and vision. As we've acknowledged that there is not an expectation that every agency is going to address every issue and um, every policy may not apply to every jurisdiction and every comprehensive plan. There's not an expectation that we're laying out in this guidance document that each agency is going to develop and create a complex work program. Again, we are trying to build the guidance and provide the pathway to help support, you know, the identification of what are the, what are the needs and issues and challenges in your community providing some resources to how we might help you um, identify those and address those, and also provide that um, kind of scale to give examples and acknowledge that meaningful impacts can be accomplished at all scales. We, we strongly believe that every jurisdiction can plan for and take actions to address climate change. Some of these might be um, small steps for agencies that are just getting started, or perhaps they have more uh, resource challenges, that's okay. There are still meaningful actions that probably are being done and can be, be taken. And then there's also examples for those that perhaps have um, um, uh, additional resources at their disposal or have perhaps more, more complex needs and describing some examples for some larger scale initiatives if the jurisdiction chooses to go that route. I think that uh, just I'm look, glancing down at my notes here. I think just again, we did provide, try to provide some examples of, of the opportunity to make progress along that spectrum from the um, more ambitious efforts down to the smaller scale. And I think again, the key message is that um, addressing your particular community needs and overall making progress. And, and that again, there is no one size fits all um, uh, lens within this guidance document. So next I'd like to move into just kind of giving you a flavor of some of the more um, particular examples and how they were addressed in the guidance document. And I'm gonna provide an example both uh, on the mitigation or the reduction of emission side, and then I'll move into an example for resilience. 
So this is uh, just a, a high level preview of this, but there are a variety of opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're focusing on transportation um, on this slide. For example, uh, planning for and supporting new and expanded transit service and transit oriented development is certainly uh, an opportunity to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. Providing safe and connected bicycle and pedestrian facilities, in particular, again, leading to uh, transit stops and stations, as well as supporting and preparing for transitioning to zero emission vehicles. So the example I'll focus in on is uh, providing safe and connected bicycle and pedestrian facilities. So within the guidance document, we, we first acknowledge that um, most jurisdictions are already doing that planning work. There are a variety of, of uh, types and scopes and extent of existing active transportation plans throughout all of the agencies in our region, which is which is great. And again, making the tie that that's something that many jurisdictions are already doing, but acknowledging that that is a, a key element that can support and address climate change. We also provide um, some, some links that we think might be helpful, some resources that might be helpful to, to improve upon and expand upon that work. So for example, uh, PSRC has developed a transportation system visualization tool that many of you might be familiar with as part of our uh, most recent regional transportation plan. We have an inventory of existing and planned bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And in full disclosure, we don't have every facility um, because we are, we are a very large region and there's a lot of facilities out there. But anything tied to a minor arterial or above and a separated pathway, we have an inventory of those facilities. So we have that in, in a, um, an interactive web-based tool. So you will be able to see where those facilities are in context with other layers. So for example, you can see where there are gaps um, for bicycle and pedestrian facilities leading to transit stations or transit stops. You can see where those facilities are and um, gaps and opportunities related to your community group. So we have our demographic information within in this. So you can see where there are higher percentages of people of color, higher percentages of people with low income or older adults or people with disabilities. Um, hopefully this is useful information. We have a lot of different layers in there. This is the example I'm providing related to um, bicycle and pedestrian facilities because access to transit is a big element um, that we work on here at PSRC. But there's a lot of other contextual layers in there as well. And this is a tool you'll also be able to see just kind of the overall system and connection. So this could be an opportunity to really identify where some of those gaps and opportunities and those necessary connections might be. We also provide a few examples of what a local jurisdiction is doing related to active transportation. Hesitate to use the term best practice because best practices, there's, there's a wide variety along that spectrum. But we try to provide some examples of real concrete, real world examples of what local jurisdictions are doing. In this case, we provide an example of what a jurisdiction, a city is doing related to their bike, uh, bike and ped planning work, but also there's an element of what they're doing and how they prioritize their investment. So we thought that would be a useful uh, example for folks to, to refer to. And then beyond that, the guidance document looks for what other resources might be out there outside of um, PSRC's box that might be helpful. And so we have a variety of resources for um, all of the policies throughout the document that we hope are helpful to um, advance this work for you. The next ex uh, example I wanted to provide is more on the resilience side. So we've talked about this a number of times. Vision 2050 certainly has policies related to both uh, general resilience, kind of resilience to the impacts from cl climate change, but also the impacts from and resilience to natural hazards. And there are some specific policies related to addressing the impacts to vulnerable populations and areas that have been disproportionately affected. So this one's a little bit more challenging. This one's probably a bit more new to folks and perhaps not as um, um, well established in your community, perhaps as the, uh, the example on, on bicycle and pedestrian planning that I just mentioned. So we really leaned into this one and we tried to provide a variety of resources to help um, one, identify where vulnerable populations might be in your community, as well as where areas that have been disproportionately impacted uh, might be in your community. So trying to help you build that, that inventory. Some of those tools, just an example, there are a number of things that PSRC has developed that we hope will be useful to you. As I mentioned, we have a demographic profile. I talked about our transportation system visualization tool, which 
um, brings a lot of different layers so you can zoom into your area and choose what you want to look at and, and see some of those connections. We also have a displacement risk map. And specific to climate and natural hazards, we also have a regional hazards map, which brings in um, the regional hazards that are around the region, as well as that demographic information. So again, providing some of these resources into some of these tools so that you can zoom into your area. And if you don't already have this information, hopefully provide a leg up to get you started. We also provide a link to the Washington Environmental Health Disparities Map, which I think would be a good resources. And then we, we look broader and there are some specific resources that are available from the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, as well as a lot of resources on the Municipal Research and Services Center um, from real world examples from ju jurisdictions who are doing the same thing and that you might be able to learn from each other. Again, staying with this example, Describing some of the, you know, describing what the policies mean, providing some of these resources to get you starter started, and really the guidance is focused on assisting you to understand what those potential impacts are facing your community, and then identifying your community's vulnerable and disproportionately impacted populations. And so we try to, throughout the document, when we're providing these resources, make these connections and uh, help you make these connections as well. And then lastly, again, we looked to um, other areas, other jurisdictions, cities and counties, not just within our region, but outside of our region and around the country for how some of the best practices and some of the ways that they're addressing this. So um, this one, because uh, equity is such an important lens for us here in this region, we spend a little bit more time on this one. So we have some examples of where other parts of the country, the adopted policies that they've um, incorporated into their planning work how they've identified some goals and actions and some specific um, plans that they have called for development of specific to this topic. We've also provided some examples and acknowledged that there are various levels of effort on this topic from around the country and different, different agencies do things a little bit differently. Um, some, and that spans the spectrum from some more detailed research and some very in-depth GIS analysis for a community that's that's done this to really identify, again, identify the impacts, identify the populations impacted. And then there's examples provided um, that are maybe less resource intensive that look to some evaluation and monitoring. So we tried to provide that spectrum and that scale for various levels of effort to meet you, again, meet communities where you are. And just one specific example, we, we looked to some, some examples of, of actions and strategies that jurisdictions are doing. Um, the example I'm providing you here is if the risk is extreme temperature, how are agencies um, addressing resilience of their community to that specific risk? And some of the actions and strategies that have been called out, some agencies are focusing on increasing the capacity of their public health and emergency response providers. Some agencies looked to providing um, more open space and uh, urban street trees. Some jurisdictions looked to providing tools to encourage um, green roof systems and cool pavements within their urban environments. And then others looked more to the, the kind of human uh, aspect and providing education to their community members on how they can be personally resilient when these extreme uh, temperature events occur. So that's really, this is really just a high flyover of, of our approach to the guidance document. Hopefully this is giving you a flavor, um, but we also wanted to acknowledge, as I mentioned at the top of this, this chat, that um, PSRC is working on a lot of different things. Uh, Vision 2050 encouraged us to do so. And we have a number of ongoing partnership projects right now. And all of these will be, once they are complete, will be available to all of you as additional resources to help your work. We are working in addition to the analysis in our regional transportation plan and our four-part greenhouse gas strategy for 2050. We are working for some on some information related to 2030. Um, seven of our partner agencies are working together on an update to the regional greenhouse gas emissions, emissions inventory, as well as an analysis of um, some of the opportunities to reduce emissions into the future. I think that's gonna be a really valuable effort that we do touch on in the guidance document about you are welcome to do your own citywide inventory or countywide inventory, but you can, you'll also be able to rely on this regional inventory and point to that and provide some consistency around the region as well. 
There's a lot of work going on on electric vehicles and zero emission vehicles, and we are also part of that. There's a, a regional electric vehicle collaborative, and we are working to develop a clearinghouse with our partners at the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. And again, not for all of these efforts that I'm talking about, we don't want to duplicate efforts. We want to complement and help facilitate connections. So this is an example of how we're trying to do that. Um, a lot of information available. And then lastly, related to climate preparedness and resilience, the Puget Sound Climate Preparedness Collaborative has been uh, engaging on these topics for many, many years now. There is a web link and we provided um, uh, resources in our guidance document related to that as well. And I hope I'm not uh, completely out of time here. So I'm gonna close there and just acknowledge, again, the draft document will be sent to you shortly. This is not a kind of a, a, a one-stop shop that's answering all your questions related to climate, but we're really trying to provide those resources and guidance and those connections to help get you started. Um, and it, I, I'm viewing this somewhat as a living document. Um, as we mentioned, our expertise is in transportation and land use. There's a lot of good work going on out there. So um, where additional uh, resources come, uh, come to mind, and depending on the questions today, if there are things that we can go out and uh, do a little bit more research in, we'll update that document. And so, Paul, with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn that over to you for, for questions if there's time. Yeah, no, you're perfectly on time, Kelly. Okay. So you're doing great. Um, we, we've just got a few questions and, and the first few are really easy. You kind of touched on, but just to kind of reemphasize, people ask, um, when will the guidance document be available? Hopefully very shortly. So when um, I'm hoping that by the time uh, Maggie sends some emails out, probably tomorrow, I'm hoping that the, the document will be available. And uh, while we uh, while our webinar was starting, we just got the notice that I believe our new website is now officially launched. So um, if not tomorrow, certainly by Friday, we should be good to go. Right. So uh, yeah, we're going through a website update and we should have that document posted this week. And um, as you said, Maggie will be sending out an email to all the attendees uh, with, with some of those links. And then somebody asked about all those resource links. So those are all in the guidance document? Yes. Yep, great. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about just, uh, is there an idea to have a regular update of, they, they ask for, they say the PSREA, I assume that's the- uh, Ah. The regional, yeah, the emissions inventory. That's a great question. So in the past, we've worked with the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency to develop the, the regional inventory. The last regional inventory was done in um, for a 2015 analysis year. This one's going to be for, I believe, a 2019 analysis year. So they're usually on a four-year cycle. I think there will always be an update. The specific seven agency partnership project is a new thing. So depending on how this goes and the success of this, I think it's certainly something we all would want to do. Um, but I'm sure you all know that I, I can't commit to bringing all seven of those agencies together again. But there, there will always be at some level um, a, an update to the regional inventory. And usually they're, they're on a kind of a three to four year cycle. And, and is that a tool for the region to track its progress or does the clean air agency do something else to kind of say like, have we made any progress? Are we reducing emissions? The the regional inventory really is, I think, that the best tool for that. I mean, there's all there's multiple sectors in the inventory and there's a lot of work going on in each sector. But the regional inventory is really kind of that snapshot in time to see the progress. Um, it's it's a detailed in a lot of work and it's not something that, you know, some metrics we can uh, report on every year or there's a monitor out there, or there's real world data, the climate inventory doesn't quite work like that. Um, and there's always a bit of a lag in terms of when data is available. But I think that is a, a really useful tool to um, track progress over time. Great, thanks Kelly. Um, one more question, or there's a couple more, I guess, just showing up in here, but one is, uh, does the guidance document have the information on how to engage the communities on this topic? That is a great question. This guidance document does not, but I believe there's another effort going on related to engaging community. And that's a that's a, um, a good suggestion that maybe I can point from this guidance document, maybe point to some of those other that other work that's going on. Yeah, there there is. Uh, I'm trying. I was trying to think offhand as to like where that's covered in other places. I, I know that there are a range of um, guidance out there about community engagement. Um, so maybe we can create some links there. Um, 
And the last question that's posted is, does the guidance uh, include tools to monitor implementation of climate change goals? Um, again, so we were tying the guidance document specific to the Vision 2050 policy. So this isn't kind of the, the one-stop shopping for all things climate. It was really tied to the Vision 2050 policies and assistance for comprehensive plan. There is some um, touch on monitoring in terms of best practices and examples. I think that question probably um, maybe is best responded to outside of this guidance document, but there's some efforts that um, PSRC is called on to do for various dashboards that we're working on to monitor a lot of different performance metrics that all, are all supportive of reducing uh, greenhouse gas and other emissions. So um, I don't know that there was a specific vision 2050 policy tied to that. So that wasn't necessarily captured in the guidance document. But again, I, I think these are um, living documents and as we, hear your questions and hear your feedback. And if we feel that there's something that maybe we can um, add to or point to in the document over time, happy to do that. Yeah, Kelly, I, I was, made me think that we do do a lot of work on monitoring. Um, that The guidance, I think most of the different guidance documents are really focused on kind of how to get to the plan update, you know, whether you're doing a comprehensive plan element or other policies or other actions. Um, but PSRC does spend a lot of time and energy thinking about monitoring of all the different aspects. Um, we also recognize that there's a, a new five-year implementation um, report aspect of GMA. So there will be kind of a, a more expectation there. And that might be something some of our other speakers as they get through their presentations might think about like what advice did they have about monitoring implementation and actions at the local level in addition to what we do at the regional level, so. Um, good stuff, Kelly. Any, anything else you want to say before we transition on to commerce? No, just thanks everyone for your time. Looking forward to um, feedback and listening forward to the next presenters. Thanks, Paul. Great. Thanks, Kelly. So next up is commerce and we're just a couple minutes um, early. So hopefully we're not catching you off guard, Sarah, but we have Sarah Fox, the um, climate change program manager from commerce, along with Gary Eidelberg, who's the mitigation lead and Michael Burnham, the resilience lead. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sarah. Sarah, are you muted? I don't hear you, but your, your presentation is showing up great. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Oh, that's bizarre. <laughs> okay, just pushing buttons on the mic here. All right, uh, as mentioned, I'm Sarah Fox and I am leading the climate program for the Department of Commerce. Uh, our team includes Michael Burnham and Gary Adelberg who will also be presenting today. So at the Department of Commerce, we strengthen communities through every aspect of community development by providing financial and technical assistance to many parts of our communities. My team is centered within growth management services, and this year we'll be providing approximately $2 million in grants to the Central Puget Sound region uh, for ba basically in, uh, early implementation of climate planning. Oops, I'm flipping a little fast. Sorry about that. In 2021, just to give you a little background, the legislature gave Commerce a head start on climate planning by directing us to lead a team of state agencies and deliver to them a model climate change element that cities and counties could adopt into their 20-year comprehensive plans. The legislature asked that we provide guidance that would help jurisdictions meet the state's greenhouse gas targets, reduce vehicle miles traveled per capita per capita, increase resilience in the face of climate exasperated natural hazards, and uplift communities most burdened by changes in the environment. This model climate change element when complete is considered to be an optional comprehensive plan element. However, it will be in good company with other voluntary elements such as economic development and parks. The model climate element will include two sub-elements which ideally work together. The sub-elements are mitigation and resilience. The model element as a whole must ensure that the policies and actions maximize co-benefits and prioritize actions that will uplift communities that have historically been impacted by climate change. Uh, 
Uh, as noticed, uh, uh, mentioned earlier, Commerce was asked to complete the climate model element by June 2023. To achieve this, we established a schedule with five phases. We are currently in the midst of the design phase. This means that we are fine tuning a list of goals and policies that we gather from our state partners and subcommittees that are composed of planners from all over the state. We recently asked that they provide us feedback on the draft measures. We sent out a, a quick email to all of them that asked them to identify any gaps or other areas of concern. So in this phase, we're developing prioritization methods that will assist the communities with focusing on those goals and policies that are the right fit for them while being consistent with our statewide climate goals. The next phase, the momentum phase, begins in September. In that phase, we will be developing the rationale and guidance for prioritizing the policies. We're going to fine tune guidance documents and launch our pilot model element with three small cities. The final draft phase begins in March. At that point, we'll check back with all of our partners to ensure that we got it right. In particular, that the model element is an effective and useful tool that any community could utilize. Our climate team is working with many talented groups and individuals. The budget specified that we collaborate with the departments of ecology, transportation, natural resources, fish and wildlife, health, and the emergency management division. We also included uh, a wider circle of expertise to include our tribal communities, frontline communities, and over 100 planners from cities, counties, public and private agencies. All right, that's the overview. Now let's dive a little deeper into our sub-elements and we'll start with mitigation. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm, I'm Gary Eidelberg. As Sarah said, I'm the mitig mitigation sub-element lead uh, person. And um, I, the definition of mitigation in the context of this project refers to efforts to reduce and or prevent the emission of greenhouse gases. The two general objectives of this effort is to help achieve statewide greenhouse gas reduction goals and reduce vehicle miles traveled and per capita vehicle miles <clears throat> traveled across the state. Both, uh, both would be done extensively through uh, GMA comprehensive plans prepared by cities and counties. Next slide, please. This is a list of the most common and significant <clears throat> greenhouse gas sources across Washington state. Probably none of them surprise any of you. One of the main objectives of producing a model mitigation element is to <clears throat> provide actionable strategies that a city or county could adopt and implement through their GMA comprehensive plans that would reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from these sources. Next slide, please. The mitigation sub-element would have two main components, a guidance section and an, and an actual model mitigation element, sub-element, which, which would have sample goals and policies that a jurisdiction could adopt and implement. I might add that uh, some of this has been, it has been also been directly influenced by uh, Vision 2050 that uh, Kelly was mentioning. The guidance, the, the guidance would be centered around three main uh, pathways or strategies that are designed to ultimately help a jurisdiction reduce and or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> the first strategy is based on developing an emission inventory and uh, Kelly briefly mentioned talking about the regional emission inventory. This is more generic which would, after uh, uh, technical steps, would lead to identifying the most significant greenhouse gas emission uh, sources in, in a jurisdiction, and then uh, choosing emission reduction targets and, and, and then uh, developing goals and, and, and policies that if implemented would reduce or eliminate those greenhouse gas emissions. All three all three strategies or pathways would be aimed toward this end. The second strategy that we would be uh, recommending or presenting is based on an emission estimate process. It's a less technic <clears throat> technically rigorous process built on 
an ecology survey, Department of Ecology survey, that lead that would lead a jurisdiction to identify greenhouse gas uh, emission sources somewhat anecdotally, and then establish a greenhouse gas emission targets, and then develop and, and choose and adopt greenhouse uh, uh, effective goals and greenhouse gas em emission reduction um, policies, um, and to to to, uh, to to bridge off of what Kelly said, one of the things that you uh, a jurisdiction could do with um, with, with this second uh, with, with this emission estimate process is lean on a regional emission uh, an emission inventory or an emission inventory of a, of a neighboring uh, jurisdiction. The the third strategy directs a jurisdiction to directly choose uh, goals and policies that the, we, the Department of Commerce, have developed and, and adopt and implement them toward uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction of greenhouse gas emission sources, which have been identified uh, to the state through the state emission inventory or a regional emission inventory or inventories of neighboring jurisdictions. Uh, next slide, please. This slide presents a, a summary of how uh, guidance and model goals and policies should inform jurisdictions and how they can address the reduction of greenhouse gases in GMA comprehensive plans. An important stipulation that applies uh, very specifically to us, but but you know, hopefully would would in, would apply to others as well, <clears throat> is a requirement. Uh, that the legislative uh, proviso gave us that the greenhouse gas uh, uh, reduction goals and policies must have a demonstrably effective um, uh, must be demonstrably effective. Some goals and policies must be present also be presented as enabling or uh, uh, enablers for greenhouse gas emission reductions to take place uh, in the future. Next slide, please. Um, all of our sample goals and policies that we would be producing <clears throat> will have been uh, pre-evaluated for technical effectiveness in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, feasibility, meaning a county or city would have the authority to adopt and implement the goals and policies, and uh, uh, environmental justice and, equ and equity. The goals and policies once adopted uh, should not burden or harm already vulnerable communities. And what we don't want is to add economic problems or social burdens to communities already struggling with poverty and <clears throat> or social inequities. The costs and burdens of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions should be equitably distributed across all communities. And uh, at, at that, I will turn it uh, over to uh, uh, Michael uh, Burnham to talk about uh, to talk about um, uh, resilient the resilient sub elements. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Gary. As Sarah mentioned, I'm Mike Burnham. I'm Climate Resilience Lead for the Department of Commerce, and I'm going to use the next few slides to go into deeper detail about the companion resilient sub element. So this will incorporate planning guidance as well as goals and policies to support preparedness, response, and recovery. So in our draft resilience planning guidance, which is undergoing initial edits, we've incorporated definitions and planning best practices from a variety of sources, including the American Planning Association, FEMA, US Climate Resilience Toolkit, and others. That's because early on, our, our partners underscored that our guidance should leverage existing climate planning tools and provide flexibility for communities to really meet them where they're at in the process of planning for climate change. So this definition of resilience you see here on the screen comes from a FEMA guidebook. And it's a really good one because it incorporates climate preparedness and response, which can include hazard mitigation and closely related climate adaptation actions, all to build the capacity, the capacity of communities to withstand and recover from climate disruptions. And those can include things such as wildfires and droughts. So this is what we mean by climate resilience as opposed to emissions mitigation. Next slide, please. 
So the budget proviso notes that our resilient sub-element must include guidance that local governments may use to not only plan for climate change impacts, but also to develop and implement policies. So in a nutshell, the planning guidance must show communities how to identify and address natural hazards exacerbated by climate change, as well as identify, protect, and enhance natural areas and habitat. So places that provide valuable ecosystem services. And finally, develop resilient infrastructure, both traditional infrastructure, such as roads and bridges, as well as green infrastructure, such as curbside bioswales. And as noted earlier, the companion menu of measures we're developing will have goals and policies that must recognize and promote as many co-benefits as possible and support environmental justice. Next slide, please. So Congress's draft resilience planning guidance suggests that all local governments start at the same place by using a University of Washington Climate Impacts Group tool to analyze expected changes in the climate. So think about indicators such as the number of extreme heat days or changes in seasonal precipitation, and also analyze climate-related hazards such as droughts and wildfires all to identify how they could worsen climate impacts in your community. So think about ecosystem, infrastructure, and societal stress. So UW is now testing a beta version of this online tool. And I'm really excited about it because it'll display and summarize at the county level changes in the climate, water cycle, and climate-related hazards. So this local government planning tool, which should be later uh, available later this year for testing will be an enhanced version of UW's tribal planning tool, which you see here on the screen. Next slide, please. So looking at the big picture, our voluntary resilience planning guidance has six steps. So steps one and two are, you know, forming that project team and assessing the science using that UW SIG tool and other resources as needed. Now, the third step in our guidance shows communities how to apply this scientific knowledge. So they would identify existing goals and policies in their comprehensive plan and other documents that either foster climate resilience explicitly or implicitly, and then identify opportunities to amend or supplement those policies. For example, with ones from our menu of measures or other sources. So the upshot here is that we're designing our planning guidance to be highly flexible. And it offers pathways, uh, which you see here in step five, to develop and integrate climate resilience goals and policies into your plan. So I'll give you an example. Pathway one might be applicable to a jurisdiction that's already developed a comprehensive climate action plan with resilience goals and policies. And they would use this pathway to integrate those policies into their comprehensive plan. Pathway two might be for a community that hasn't done any climate planning work. Uh, so they might opt to take a more streamlined approach where they select uh, goals and policies from our menu of measures and then integrate those into their comprehensive plan. Now, pathways three and four are a bit more labor intensive as they incorporate a science-based climate vulnerability and risk assessment. So a community might opt to take pathway three, for example, if it intends to develop a comprehensive climate action plan with resilience goals and policies. And a community might opt to take pathway four if they're updating their hazard mitigation plan to incorporate climate change. As you may know, as of April 2023, FEMA will will require that all updated hazard mitigation plans incorporate climate change and other future conditions into the required risk assessment as part of that process. So as Sarah mentioned earlier, we'll be pilot testing our draft resilience guidance in Washington communities this fall. And I'm really excited about this because it's going to provide uh, an initial opportunity to test out this UW Climate Impacts Group local climate planning tool as well as iron out any wrinkles in our draft planning guidance by the middle of next year. Next slide, please. With that, I'm gonna hand things back off to Sarah. All right, thank you. So I'm going to wrap up our presentation with just a few more slides about our final model element, which will include both the mitigation resilience of elements. So as we've been noting, our team will provide sample goals and policies that could be either added to a comprehensive plan as a unique climate chapter or integrated throughout. Our goals and policies will be provided in a searchable database that will be organized in several ways. First, we'll ensure that we have a suite of measures that address the most common climate categories, 
which will be compatible with guidance from our state and local agencies. As you'll see, we have a list of those categories to the right of the screen. The measures will also be organized to ensure that there is a nexus with the required and optional comprehensive plan elements. We're working to ensure that the sample measures provide an indication of other benefits that they provide, aside from simply meeting a transportation or land use climate goal. And so those, some of those co-benefits are housing affordability, uh, tribal treaty rights, uh, or their ecosystem services. And finally, we are working with Front and Centered as a contractor to lead a team of eight individuals from areas in the state that are identified on the Department of Health's Environmental Health Disparities Map as being most impacted by climate change. They'll review the draft measures and provide recommendations to inform our prioritization scheme. Their work will identify how costs and benefits of actions will be distributed fairly across communities in order to avoid dis disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable in our community. We have a few sample measures up here on the screen just to kind of show you a little bit point in time of our work. But for example, uh, some of those sectors like a transportation sector, uh, we have a goal such as reduce vehicle miles traveled. Uh, we'll have several sample policies to go along with those. And then we'll ensure that if you're searching for anything in the transportation realm, you'll know that it, it would also fit within your transportation element of your comprehensive plan. Uh, under healthy ecosystems, a lot of those goals and policies would also fit perhaps within a land use or environment or parks uh, element of your comprehensive plan. And next up, uh, our climate program is working towards having a full draft by June 2023. Uh, however, uh, you can have uh, preview some of our work by visiting our website. We have some drafts up there where we have dashboards that follow along with some of our collaborative teams. And also you could subscribe to our listserv there and check in you know, periodically with some of our updates. And with that, we'll take any questions you may have. Great. Thanks, Sarah, uh, Michael, and Gary. Appreciate that. Um, Natalie had a question, and she says she has to leave at 11, so I don't know if she's still listening, but we'll try to, maybe we can really quickly try to answer her question. And she was just noting about how both PSRC has some guidance, and then you're also developing the model element and some guidance. Um, and so Sarah, also Kelly, um, there, is there overlap or how do these intersect and overlap um, recognizing that the two different agencies roles? Uh, Sarah, you want to start with that? Sure. Yeah. So so our guidance is uh, will be applicable statewide. So we'll be really looking at um, ensuring that our guidance covers pretty much any will apply to almost any city or county throughout the state versus, uh, you know, PSRC is going to be focusing more on your regional um, uh, uh, issues and whatnot that you need to address. And also uh, our guidance, you know, is also mirroring some of the work that's happening in the legislature. So uh, as uh, we kind of briefly mentioned, we have, we're trying to incorporate uh, work that's happening by our partner agencies and Department of Transportation and Ecology and, and other agencies to ensure that at the end of the day, our guidance is pointed to some of the, integrating some of the required things that you have to do perhaps with your shoreline master um, plans and other you know, required work that you're, that you need to include into your comp plans. Yeah, and, and Kelly, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I think, because I, um, reading through the question, I, I think Sarah's absolutely right. I think our guidance is first and foremost focused on what Vision 2050 says about um, what, what local jurisdictions can and should do related to climate change. It's not solely focused on transportation and land use, but there's certainly that more um, detailed layer in, in ours. And I view us as kind of being a, a sub piece of the commerce guidance, which is certainly statewide, but you probably go um, more comprehensive on certain topics than we perhaps do in, in our guidance and, and Vision 2050. So I think each community kind of in figuring out where they are, what their needs are, what their um, risk factors are. And I think there will be opportunities and elements of both guidance documents that can really help to, to serve them depending on, on what it is that they need to plan for. Great, thank you. Um, it, just a note, kind of following up from the prior Q&A, uh, Maggie put a couple things in the chat. 
uh, both a link to PSRC's equitable engagement guidance uh, document. So that uh, we had the question about, are there ways to engage communities? And then Lisa Poole, uh, she's the climate lead at the Municipal Research and Services Center. And she uh, forwarded the link um, that we've posted here of their equity engagement in climate response. So those are posted in the chat. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you saw those. Um, we had another question. I think this really goes to Michael and maybe it'll come out or maybe you already have it, but the link to the UW climate tool that you talked about. Yeah, I see the question in the chat. So the uh, full title of this is quite a mouthful. It's changes in the climate or climate related natural hazards for Washington state. Uh, that's the UW SIG tool I mentioned. Um, I do have a, a link to the URL and I'm happy to put that in the chat as well. Great, Michael, you may have to uh, forward it to Maggie. I'm not sure that we can directly chat, <laughs> just to warn you. Um, uh, another question, uh, I'm not sure like who's best at this, so we'll just try it, but will cultural resources include funds to enhance staff cultural intelligence? Improving cultural intelligence can often lead to savings um, while um, ER planning. Um, any thoughts about uh, cultural resources and how they connect to this? Uh, well, we won't be providing specific guidance about uh, cultural resources, um, and I guess from the aspect of that that question, but we we do have a sample goals and policies that do address uh, protection of cultural resources. Um, I, I could also bring up our screen. I have our um, our full list of measures available, but it's um, but that is one of the elements that will be included in our final model. Yeah, um, there's a question about forestry and mineral resources uh, uh, being included in the guidance uh, from Chris. Chris, I'm not sure if you're meaning like you know the list of different resource documents that we're preparing, or specifically within climate. Within climate, I know that part of our um, guidance and information will talk about um, open space and environmental preservation. And, um, and I think hearing from Sarah, like that's also an aspect of the commerce work. Um, as you said, Sarah, like shorelines, there are other aspects of environmental protection that are a key part of both on the resilience and on preservation um, like sequestering uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Do you want to yeah. say anything, but Gary? It looks like yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Th thanks, Paul. Yeah, and as part of the uh, mitigation, we've been talking, having discussions with uh, Department of Natural Resources and Fish and Wildlife about how to, how to best present uh, sample goals and policies that will encourage uh, uh, preservation of farmland and resources land that will allow. Uh, for sequestration and not uh, <clears throat> having, uh, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions in the first place. And so we, we, that we, we're not going to, we definitely are going to be including some of that in, in the, uh, in the mitigation sub element. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gary. Um, I think this might be the last question and it's kind of the best for last year. Perhaps what's on many people's minds, Sarah, you were probably anticipating this one from the beginning. But so what happens if the legislature adopts something this year or in this next session? Um, <laughs> any thoughts as to like, so if we have these model elements, like what's that mean for local requirements? Um I, I think we all have to kind of speculate, but mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you've had discussions. Uh, uh, how would you respond to that, Sarah? Well, we are uh, creating a model element right now uh, that at the end of the day, we anticipate someday uh, the legislature passing legislation to make it a required element. And so in our prioritization uh, method that we, this multi-criteria prioritization method, we're including some type of a like a point system or something along the lines that will really help communities um, you know ensure that their their climate element meets a particular threshold if if it's established by the legislature <laughs> um, as I mentioned at the beginning since it's just optional right now uh, perhaps the prioritization methods really just going to be for the purposes of showing that um, a goal or policy 
uh, you know, a particular set of goals or policies would uh, be considered adequate overall from the state perspective, perspective for, for a climate plan. Uh, so that's kind of how we're addressing it is to make sure that we are kind of setting it up to someday be something that uh, we could uh, more objectively uh, measure whether or not uh, the climate elements can be, I guess, uh, approved because the last version of of the bill, House Bill 1099, uh, was indicating that commerce would be approving uh, climate plans. And so, and we'd also be uh, working for uh, putting forward rulemaking and whatnot. So if it passes, uh, I don't think our model element's gonna look so different from what we're creating right now, but there'll be a lot of other pieces in the background that are happening. Uh, and we'll have a larger staff and <laughs> just a whole lot of other things will be happening next summer. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I want to point out a couple of things. One is that Vision 2050 already establishes some expectations for climate planning. So within the Puget Sound region, regardless of what the legislature does, um, there should be an effort to align with those policies at the regional level. Um, and then two, I think what, what your team and Kelly were both saying is that there are a lot of things that cities are doing um, so that if there is a requirement that's passed, um, they should be able to build off a lot of their work, whether that's hazard planning um, or it's ped bike planning or it's working towards walkable neighborhoods. Um, there are a lot of different things that a lot of many of the cities pretty much have been incorporating into the plan. So the effort isn't really starting from zero, but it's looking at what you do. Maybe some of those things need to be boistered or elevated to be able to meet climate objectives. Um, but I would say that they should be able to pull on a lot of the work that they're probably already planning to do as part of their update. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, our guidance is really going to be helping communities just do good planning when it comes to climate work. I mean, all of the guidance that we've been describing so far is really just walking them through the steps of, of where to find good information. And hopefully our, our website at that time, you know, come next summer, will actually provide some really easy links to deeper diving into particular subjects if if that particular city is interested in going further. So uh, we have all those um, I ideas, <laughs> I guess, in, in motion right now. Um, so we look forward to sharing more perhaps with you all in the spring uh, or even at the end of our project. Yeah, I, I, we expect to have our guidance out soon in the next few days, but as you said, um, you'll have your draft elements um, out later and then continuing work through that. So there should be a continuation of, of different sources um, and materials available to people. And as you said, a lot of this comes down to uh, kind of doing good planning. Um, we, we had a recent conversation with the Puyallup tribe and um, some of us on a kind of different topic of like, how do we engage with the tribes? Well, engage with the tribes on land use issues, on climate issues, on environment issues. It, it kind of circles back to that idea of like, how do we do comprehensive planning under GMA? Um, I think those are the questions that I see right now. So I think we're able to transition over to uh, Tumwater and the Thurston Regional Planning Council. Thank you so much, Commerce team. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Um, so let's, um, I think, let's see, now, uh, now I forgot, Allison or Alyssa, who's going to be the starter? Yeah, Allison, you're going to start, right? So I'm going to lead it off, yep. Allison Osterberg, welcome. You're a senior planner from the Thurston Regional Planning Council, and we also have Alyssa Jones-Wood from the city of Tumwater. Um, we wanted to have um, more than just kind of the usual suspects from the Puget Sound region, and they've been doing great work, um, have, I think, some important information to share. So I'll turn it over to you, Allison, to kick off your segment. Great. Good morning. And uh, it's been really great to hear from our previous presenters. I'm going to echo a lot of those themes. Um, and for our presentation, uh, just for introduction, I'm Allison Osterberg with the Thurston Regional Planning Council, and I'll be co-presenting today with my colleague, Alyssa Jones-Wood, State Sustainability Coordinator with the City of Tumwater. So let me just pull these slides up. There we go. 
So one thing I uh, wanted to emphasize, as you heard today, there's a lot of guidance and information that exists and is coming around climate change and it can feel pretty overwhelming and the scale of the work that we need to do to meaningfully address the climate challenge to our region and our communities can also feel pretty overwhelming. Um, but I, I just want to bring a little bit of perspective of what it can mean in our region. Uh, in the Thurston region, we've been doing some climate planning over the past few years on more of a voluntary basis. And I think it's important to think beyond the planning stage. I'll talk a little bit about our planning efforts in our region. And Alyssa will talk about some of the specifics that, that, that their, their city has been involved in. But I think it's really important that there are lots of things that you're already doing to support climate action in your community. And you're, we're not starting from scratch here. It's really just, um, thinking about it in a new way. Hey, Allison, so just, we, yeah. we see your presentation look, looking great, but it's not in the uh, sli full slideshow, full screen mode yet. Let me try again. How's yes. that? Perfect, thank you. Great. So Thurston Regional Planning Council, much like PSRC, we're a metropolitan planning organization and a regional transportation planning organization, but we have a slightly different function in our region. Um, we don't play all the same role that PSRC does. Uh, we do have a 23 member council, which includes the jurisdictions within Thurston County, as well as school boards, our water districts, um, tribes, many other community organizations. And we work in a lot of different areas collaboratively where we need to um, discuss things that cross our borders. And climate change over the past few years has been one of those areas that has come up a lot in our regional work. Some of that dates back to a planning effort we did. It's a little bit like Vision 2050. Uh, we call it the Sustainable Thurston Plan. And that was completed in 2013. And it was a visioning process for a region that identified how we wanted the Thurston region to look, function, and feel looking out at that time to 2035. It was really kind of targeted to be in advance of the last round of periodic comprehensive plan updates. And that plan included a number of priority goals, one of which is that as a region, we wanted to move toward carbon neutrality. Um, and at that point, we hadn't done any climate planning and we said, well, we should probably get on that. As part of that work, we've had a number of plans that have been developed on a regional basis. The first was a climate adaptation plan, which was completed in 2018. That was funded um, by a grant that TRPC and Thurston County worked on together uh, from the Department of Commerce and Department of Ecology and it was watershed based. It included gathering a lot of the information we had at the time and developing a summary of how climate change would be affecting our region, what kind of vulnerabilities we had specifically, uh, and how, um, what kind of actions we might take to address, uh, to help better adapt to some of those vulnerabilities that we identified. And that plan was completed um, and it's there, it exists as a resource for communities, some of which had that were then able to incorporate some of the plans and strategies and actions um, and information from the adaptation plan into their last round of comprehensive plan updates. Following the completion of the adaptation plan, there was also interest in the community in looking at the mitigation side of um, the climate question and our four largest jurisdictions decided to partner together to develop a joint climate mitigation plan. And so that was Thurston County, Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater. Um, and the, that led to the development of the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan, which is focused on work that those four jurisdictions and other partners can do in our region to reduce locally generated emissions. And that plan includes, um, it does include a sector-based emissions inventory. So what are our local contributions to greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, it includes um, a number of mitigation actions. 
and it was and an overall implementation strategy. And a big difference in this planning effort is that um, it was funded by the four jurisdictions. wasn't any kind of mandate. It wasn't any kind of requirement that designated. There was just a real interest among the community and policymakers and staff in having something that would enable them to move forward and a real feeling that they could move forward farther by working together. I, and I think that's led to some, um, some differences in how the plan is being implemented compared to the adaptation plan. So, and I'll, it's, this is more recent, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the climate mitigation planning effort. So the climate mitigation plan, one of the things that it started with uh, among those, those four jurisdictions is that they adopted common emission reduction targets. And those were to reduce emissions 45% by 2030 and 85% by 2050 using 2015 as a baseline. Now our regional goals are a little bit different from the state goals, which were updated slightly after our process. And so that's something we might look again look at updating again in the future. But at this point, regionally, what's nice is that everyone is, is pointing in the same direction to the same emission targets. And also as part of that planning process for both the adaptation plan and the mitigation plan, they also, something that was really important to, in our planning effort, folks wanted it to be, yes, a plan that was looking at reducing emissions, but how can we do it in a way that supports our overall community goals? And so those plans also are targeted to addressing the goals that we developed through sustainable search and through that regional plan. So how can we address climate change, but in a way that uh, helps support our vision for creating vibrant urban centers and neighborhoods, preserving environmentally sensitive lands, protecting water quality, supporting local food systems, um, growing our economy, all of these other regional goals that we had. And so those coal benefits, how do we, how do we address climate change, but in a way that integrates it into our overall community vision has been a really strong theme of our planning process. The climate mitigation plan ultimately developed what we call a framework for local mitigation action. And collectively what that means is that we're looking just generally to uh, overall green our grid, so moving supporting especially state level action to move toward 100% um, renewable electricity sources. We're also looking for ways that we can live lighter and reduce our emissions by creating more dense urban networks, um, making it easier to telework, walk, bike, ride transit, um, and to reduce our overall waste. We're then with a cleaner electrical grid, we're looking to shift more sources of our emissions to cleaner energy sources, so shifting away from gas, shifting toward um, how can we support a transition to electric and alternative fuels, how can we support more of those um, ways of heat, heating and powering homes that rely more on renewable sources locally. And um, we're also looking for ways to store, so something that came up a lot in our process was um, embracing the work in our region around conserving sensitive lands. And so looking at ways that our natural eco ecosystems can store carbon and support um, reducing emissions through agriculture, through protection and reforestation of tree areas, um, how, and through preservation of prairie areas. Uh, and we also see that there's a lot of importance in building local capacity and resilience. So continuing to provide coordinated leadership, being able to speak as one voice on our priorities around climate change, developing expertise and monitoring our progress. I saw there are a lot of questions in the chat about how we monitor and that has been, um, monitoring our progress on our climate plan has been an important theme um, in some of our work going forward. So I just want to note that uh, as we move from a climate framework and our, we're in the Thurston region, our uh, comprehensive plan periodic update timeline is 2025. So we're a little bit behind the PSRC region, um, but it's, we're not starting from scratch. Um, what we found in developing that climate mitigation plan 
we had that sector-based emissions inventory, a lot of the actions that we developed, some of them are new, but many of them we realized that the programs that we already had already existed in our plans that we already had programs for are ones that also had climate benefits. And so you can look at climate sectors and I thought um, the folks from Commerce highlighted this really well, but you kind of have to do this work of translation and only you as a planner will know how, how these climate concepts translate into the programs um, and the priorities of your own community. Uh, so, you know, we might be talking about energy use in buildings, um, transportation emissions, reducing waste, our agricultural programs in the climate context, but many of these things already exist uh, or, and the process to get them done already exists through our capital facilities plans, our utilities plans, our transportation improvement program. Uh, if you have a commute trip reduction program, housing policies, hazard planning, all these, all these kinds of efforts are already out there. And often it just takes looking at them in a new way um, and having the people who work in those programs understand that the work they're doing also touches on climate. So in our region, when we completed the climate mitigation plan, there was a strong feeling among the partners that they wanted to continue that momentum and continue coordinating. And so um, kind of a difference from the adaptation plan and some of our other plans is that there is an ongoing interlocal agreement uh, to continue to bring those communities together to maintain momentum on implementing the climate mitigation plan, look for ways to work together regionally to support that planning effort and um, continue to be accountable that we're making progress on that plan, including through incorporating it into other efforts. Something that I think made, um, has led to this, the success that we've had in our region and something for folks to think about as they're moving into thinking about how climate planning might work in your region um, or in your community. We had a really high level of public interest and continue to have. We have a lot of folks in all of our partner communities who are speaking up frequently and wanting to see, um, wanted to see a climate plan developed and really now want to see it implemented. And that really keeps it front and center for our, all of our partners. We have really strong leadership among elected officials who want to um, not only want to lead on climate change, but want to work together to see it um, accomplished in our region. Something that has been um, growing throughout this process is staff expertise. And Alyssa is a great example. Um, after the completion of the climate mitigation plan, I think there was a recognition among a lot of our jurisdictions that the planning effort was one thing, but to do the work in the plan might, would require new levels of staff expertise. And so that's led to some changes in structure and hiring in some of our communities uh, to, so that they could really focus some staff expertise on these, on these actions. And something we recognize through our process is that there's a lot of work happening at the state level um, that can support the work that we wanna do. And we can only be successful by really helping support the state in being successful in their goals. And so the work that commerce is doing the work that's happening in many other state agencies um, is really supporting our ability to be successful in meeting our local goals. So I'll highlight a couple of lessons I think that we've learned along the way, um, and then I'll hand it over to Alyssa to talk about some specific things that Tumwater is working on. Uh, I just echoing what Paul was talking about, there you already have many of the programs and policies that will support climate action. It might take um, thinking about them in a new way, thinking about how they need to be expanded or targeted to um, address the climate vulnerabilities or needs in your community. I really wanna emphasize this next point, uh, planning is just the first step. I think this is true for every part of a comprehensive plan, but it's important in the planning effort to anticipate what it will mean to implement those policies who will own those actions once your long range planners are done and your plans adopted, um, who's going to carry them forward. And on that line, it's important in the planning effort to build internal capacity and ownership across departments and work programs. Um, I think Tom Water has a really great example about how they're doing that, that, that we'll hear about. 
And another thing is that there's there's just so much to climate change. It touches on so many different areas. And so it can get really overwhelming. And so an important thing to do is to think about how to prioritize among the actions you have and where you have partners in your community. Who else can lead on things and how can you hand things off and how can things be done? How can you move forward in, in multiple different areas? But it doesn't all have to be carried by one person or one program or one department. It's probably better if it's if you share the load. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Alyssa Jones-Wood, Sustainability Coordinator from the City of Tumwater. Thank you, Allison, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with Tumwater, we are a 10.8 square mile city with about 26,000 residents. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the Squaxin Island tribe's habitation of what is now Tumwater that spans thousands of years. The ancestral families who lived and thrived here were known as the Stetches. They occupied prosperous villages along the shores of the Salish, sea and the Salish, Salish Sea and the Deschutes River. Today, Squaxin people continue the stewardship of, the, of their ancestral lands from the Deschutes watershed and what is now Bud Inlet. Next slide, please. Like Allison said, uh, the City of Tumwater accepted the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan in 2021, committing to those regional emissions targets and also committing to the implementation of the plan. To implement the plan, the city uh, worked to build capacity amongst existing staff and also in 2022 added a full-time position of a sustainability coordinator. And that's me. Next slide, please. Prior to accepting that plan, however, Tumwater was busy establishing a program for sustainability itself within our green team, which is a interdepartmental team in which every department has a representative and we meet on a monthly basis um, to work on issues related to city operations, sustainability, and climate change mitigation. We're working on our third annual report right now, which assesses um, greenhouse gas inventories, water, energy, uh, fuel consumption, natural gas, and uh, gas and diesel. We meet monthly, like I said, and we work on a lot of different proposals. It's actually been really exciting to hear everybody's perspective and the different uh, aspects of their departments that they want to uh, make more sustainable or switch to a different direction. And I'm really happy to have this interdepartmental group because outside of the laundry list of climate actions that we all know that we need to take or that we'll be seeing in the model element coming out soon, um, there are some unique things that each of us bring to the table. Um, something that I did with my department recently was we did the climate VENS exercise that Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson has recently put out, um, where it's basically this three-part Venn diagram, what brings you joy, what are you good at, what needs doing, in order to discern your unique climate action that you as an individual um, have unique power to, to take on. And this is something that we're working on doing across the city so that we can all see the things that we need to do from the TCMP, but then also what we're uniquely qualified to do. Some of the things that the green team has worked on recently is drafting an anti-idle policy for our fleet vehicles and revising our commute trip reduction policy to include incentives for uh, electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles. Next slide, please. And the green team was busy at work before I got here. Um, one of the things that they did was add 20, a 20 kilowatt system um, PV on City Hall, which we're working on expanding, hopefully soon with some grant opportunities. They also replaced all of the city-owned streetlights with LEDs, and we're in the process of replacing 900 lights in our uh, Tumwater Library with LEDs this year. The picture in the middle is from literally last week, in which case uh, we were doing a walkthrough for an ESCO process looking at our water and sewer infrastructure and all buildings. We know that through the Green Team's annual reports that our city operations emissions are like 60% from our water infrastructure. So any ways that we can improve efficiency is what we need to be working on. We've also installed six level two EV chargers for our fleet vehicles. We have currently one full battery electric vehicle, the LEAF that you see here, one plug-in hybrid, and we have four um, F-150 Lightnings on order to start um, implementing EVs with some of our field staff. We're also working this year on adding three public and workplace chargers at City Hall. And soon also a full-scale electrification assessment for our fleet, um, doing some solar on some small water infrastructure, a valve and a fill station, doing a solar feasibility assessment of all of our properties and buildings included ground-mounted solar opportunities, a demonstration garden at City Hall, which I'm really excited about to um, show some low-impact uh, 
gardening methods, but then also how we can remove toxins through the way that we use and treat land, and some various water and energy efficiency improvements throughout our infrastructure and facilities. Next slide, please. The City Council also has a strategic priority to be a leader in environmental sustainability, and part of that is committing for all of our future buildings to be all electric. So in the next two to three years, we'll be building our new operations and maintenance building facility, and it will be all electric. That's a first for us. We're planning on having a large number of solar panels on top of all of the buildings and adding a lot of EV chargers for our fleet and also public use. Next slide, please. We've also committed uh, through PSE's Green Direct program a uh, power purchase agreement for the Skookumchuck Wind Farm, which is uh, just south of us, I guess, on the Thurston County, Lewis County line. Um, in 2021, this reduced our net city operations emissions by 70%. So this is a really great win for us in terms of net emissions. Still have the total emissions to work on, but this is helpful on the path forward. Next slide, please. Um, we're also working on actions related to land use and transportation to reduce emissions and improve quality of life, uh, transforming our brewery district through a land use designation into a lively, walkable, and economically vibrant neighborhood center. At the top, you'll see a picture of what it looks like now, very car-oriented, and on the bottom, the vision that we hope it will be. I muted myself. Sorry about that. Um, in 2021, uh, at the behest of passionate community members and youth, the city passed a climate emergency resolution. Now, this resolution and the input and insights of our community members guide my work every day. I strongly feel that we can't and shouldn't approach climate mitigation only as a math problem of emissions in, emissions out, or emissions avoided, but that we really need to incorporate quality of life um, improvements and environmental conditions improvements as much as we can. So I take this into mind every day as I'm doing my work, and I think about these students that are Thurston County students um, and what future lies ahead of them. I'm a young person as well, and um, I relocated here because of the climate situation in South Florida just a few months ago. So I personally, and I'm sure all of us have our own story to tell and how climate change impact, impacts our lives and our futures, but this is something that I think about a lot. Next slide, please. My program is housed in water resources and sustainability, so I would be remiss to not mention water explicitly on a whole slide. Um, in 27 and 20, 20, 2017 and 2018, prior to the TRPC adaptation plan, um, our department consulted two different consultants looking at uh, climate change impacts on our groundwater resources for our water production goals. And despite us being in pretty good shape on that front, uh, we know that conserving abundant resources is a sustainable thing to do for future generations, and we have committed to using as much reclaimed water as we can get our hands on. Um, in this picture here, you can see a million gallon tank that holds reclaimed water from our wastewater treatment plant that uh, serves the region, and last year we used 42.3 million gallons of uh, reclaimed water um, to operate our golf course instead of using potable water. Now, we all know that there's a nexus between potable water consumption and energy, uh, the energy it takes to produce that. So this helps reduce our emissions in a small way, as well as touch on the water resources that we need to conserve despite them being abundant. Next slide, please. In 2021, we also adopted a revised, a new version of our urban forestry management plan. Um, Tumwater is home to various habitat types, urban, riparian, forest, and prairie, and this plan looks to balance the protection and support of that community and urban forest with other city strategic priorities, affordable housing, a walkable urban community, climate change, as well as protecting endangered species. In our case, um, our prairies here in Tumwater are home to the endangered Mazama pocket gopher, so like wildly doing afforestation everywhere, um, is not something that we can do. We need to make sure that we're doing it smart uh, with diversity in the places where it's not going to impact other strategic priorities of our community. And also with our tree planting efforts that we're definitely working on, um, we work with our tree board to consider how changing climate will affect the species that can survive here, as well as uh, different species of pests which may impact our trees and our forests. Next slide, please. I'm also working with the small community team to get Thurston County as a whole uh, designated as a community wildlife habitat. That's a program through the National Wildlife Federation. So that's done through having a number of, it could be patios, it could be acres of uh, green space that 
provides habitat, food, water, shelter, and a place to raise young. Then there's a process um, on the back end for those government agencies or those agencies working on that designation to attain points for outreach, education, administration, and wildlife requirements. Again, I don't want to approach climate change as just a math problem, and it's not only a human problem either, so I'm happy to weave in these efforts for wildlife into our overall resilience effort. Next slide, please. And we're engaging with stakeholders and residents often on our actions, uh, what's working and what's not. And some things that we're working on right now are the tree and vegetation protection ordinance. Um, so like our tree protection ordinance for our heritage trees and so on and so forth. Um, tree protection and street tree plan, um, making sure that we're putting the right tree in the right place. Um, we have some lessons learned from past projects that we want to make sure that we're not replicating, that we're doing the right thing moving forward. And also our landscape ordinance. The tree board you can see is in the bottom right there, um, planting a tree at Arbor Day last year, actually this year, it feels like a year ago. Um, they have been providing expertise and guidance to the city on matters related to forest and trees for over 20 years. The city of Tumwater is a new member of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and that network um, allows us to learn from other practitioners in our region, but then uh, across North America um, to gain new ideas, um, not have to reinvent the wheel on some other things and uh, to get new perspectives on things, including fundamental changes in worldview on sustainability, which has been really interesting to see. So to end, I just want to share a quote that I'm guided by each day by Heather McGee. Inequality and climate change are the twin challenges of our time and more democracy is the answer to both. Thank you. Wow, that, that was Really great, both those presentations, Allison. I appreciated yours as a kind of a what's another regional council doing, and um, you know a lot of things for us to learn from from your work, uh, Alyssa. Great example of what a community can do, um, and in some ways, I think you kind of answered one of the questions is up up here. I'll I'll read out it. I'll kind of paraphrase, but um, perhaps you can you can help address it. Um, Kate asks about like, well, there's there's so much focus on transit in the Puget Sound region, and a lot of that transit is the light rail corridors, I-5, 405, where there's BRT, kind of these big investments in transit. What about other communities that are less connected to transit, uh, and how do they address that? Um, Alyssa, you just mentioned a whole bunch of things, and none of them that were about light rail. Um, maybe you can just kind of reemphasize the point of kind of Tumwater's situation, uh, how it relates to transit and how it doesn't, and how you're kind of proceeding with some of these things regardless of that. I could answer from a Tumwater local perspective, and I'm sure Allison has other aspects to, to add in the regional perspective since she's a transportation planner agency. Um, in terms of Tumwater, we're focused on um, making sure that we are improving efficiency. So we're trying to add roundabouts through ways, making sure that we are adding bike lanes. Um, we're not Seattle. We don't we don't have all the beautiful bike lanes everywhere, but we're working on adding them everywhere we can. Sidewalks, we have sidewalk inventories. We're looking at accessibility. Um, and in the in the coming weeks and months, we're going to be doing some outreach to um, improve people's understanding of what safe biking is um, for both the bikers and pedestrians and also um, that it's safe and awesome and excellent to ride the bus. Uh, we're participating in the week without, without driving that's coming up in September. A lot of our staff are and we're encouraging our staff to ride the bus for a week to experience what it's like to only have that option um, for equity and also accessibility. So that'll be an interesting experience for a lot of our, our staff and elected officials as well. And I'll let Allison speak to it more so. Uh, yeah, we, we do not have and are not likely to have in the near future light rail in the Thurston region in the same way. Um, and we're only beginning to experiment with uh, bus rapid transit in our area. So a big part of our climate planning has been, you know, transportation emissions, just like in other parts of the state, are, are one of our largest sources of emissions. And so we have a number of different ways that we're trying to track that. Some of that is in how can we support a transition to electric vehicles and alternative fuel vehicles, because there are many parts of our community that are not served by transit, even though we do have a fantastic uh, transit system and a fantastic rural transit system. There are, are many uh, rural parts of our community that are just disconnected. Um, 
from that. So how do we make that more accessible? And then how do we plan in a way that um, I, I think we're, ha we're having a discussion in our area or beginning to, and we have had for a long time, a discussion about land use planning um, in terms of our centers and corridors. And we've often had this concept about neighborhood centers. How can we even in our small communities and in smaller areas have ways that we can provide options for people um, where they live, where they don't always need to go and get a car. Uh, and I'd also say that um, we have looked at the extension and improvement in broadband services as a climate mitigation strategy in our region, just enabling better the better ability for connectivity for people um, is also a way that we can help minimize some of the commute uh, travel times. Yeah, those, those are great examples. Um, I would say that within the Puget Sound region, as Kelly was saying, trying to uh, meet communities where they're at and in recognizing their uh, conditions, their context that they have. Um, that said, it's like we do anticipate that every community has an opportunity to be able to address climate change in their different ways and to look at how, especially the transportation network can uh, be planned for in a way that reduces um, climate emissions. So there's the, how do we remove some of the trips from the system? I thought the brewery district is a great example of like, hey, here's a commercial node, very auto dependent right now, but are there ways we can make it more walkable, reduce some of those trips? So even if maybe your commute trips are still by vehicle, maybe there's ways to just cut out some of those other trips and create areas that are more walkable, more bikeable. Um, it's a great thing. And then where we can't reduce trips, and you you both uh, really hit on this, is to how can we improve electrification of the transportation system? So uh, where we can reduce trips, great. Let's really focus on that. But also then let's look at the trips that we don't anticipate are, are being removed. Are there ways that we can use electric vehicles, provide charging, uh, provide alternative fuel choices for those? So I, I think that's what we're looking for um, in the Puget Sound region, um, which kind of goes along with another question, which was um, some of the, the guidance, like the commerce guidance won't be out or the co commerce example element won't be out until next year. Uh, does that change? Um, kind of the due date for comprehensive plans and for PSRC's review. So uh, the, the due date still the end of 24 as required by GMA. Currently, those GMA requirements uh, don't include all the climate stuff. We will be looking for some level of addressing climate within your comprehensive plans at PSRC as part of that certification process. That doesn't mean you have to have a full element. Um, so that in some ways the bar is relatively low. We're looking for, are you addressing uh, climate change both from a um, emission standpoint? Are there ways to reduce emissions? Are there ways to electrify, support electrification? Are there ways to enhance resilience within your community and your comprehensive plan? So there are different ways to do that. And we're glad to be able to provide both the, the guidance that we'll have shortly and to be able to talk with you further about that. Kelly, you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to, one of the things that I wanted to address that particular comment, because one of the, the themes that I heard throughout all three of our presentations um, is that there's really no need to wait. I know I know some folks might think that, well, if we're, we need to wait for the for the tool, we need to wait for the guidance, we need to, to wait for the really clear um, kind of rules and regulations. But I think the theme from all of our presentations is that there's good work going on right now some of this are, 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 you know, we're not reinventing the wheel in terms of the opportunities to address climate change and resilience. And I think all of the guidance documents that are that are being developed and all the great work that Allison and, and Alyssa just mentioned, there's a lot of information already out there. Folks, folks can start now. Folks can be making meaningful progress now. Yeah. I think things will, you know, the as gu guidance continues to come out, as tools continue to be developed, that will only make things stronger. But I think our our message here at PSRC, and I think definitely the message, uh, Allison, I'm going to steal from that uh, slide you had on lessons learned. There's good stuff out there, and everyone can be making forward progress now. So I, th I thought that was just a a really good kind of connective note from from all all levels from the state and the two other regions. Right, and, and I was going to point to Allison too. Just your earlier comments about. 
Um, in so many ways, climate planning is integrated planning uh, across land use, transportation, environment, um, even economic development. So it's something where in many ways you're already doing it, and it's also an opportunity to really pull those things together and to look at how they affect pollution, emissions, resilience um, across the board. So I exactly, Kelly, I think there's a lot of opportunity for cities and counties to be able to do some great work during this update. Uh, this isn't go going to go away, <laughs> so it's not like you're going to adopt the magic policy in the next two years and then never be able to need to do anything further. Uh, this is probably going to be an ongoing challenge for a long time, so we'll we'll hopefully make some great efforts during the comp plan updates, but there will probably be continued new materials, new guidance that will come out in future years and, and need for additional work in the future as well. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Give a second there. Um, I do want to once again say thank you, um, Allison, Alyssa, Michael, um, Gary, Sarah, and Kelly for just doing a great job presenting. I found it very informative. I spend a lot of time working and thinking on these issues, but still saw a lot of stuff that I, I just thought that was really helpful, inspiring, and informative. Um, Maggie, you're going to come on and give us um, a, a final survey, a final survey question about this, and also we would really appreciate it if people would fill out the Title VI survey that you're going to provide at the end here. Go ahead, Maggie. Thank you, and thank you to all of our presenters. We have a few follow-up questions. We just want to ask all of our attendees. The first one is, how are you feeling after the workshop? So before today's webinar, we asked you how you were feeling about um, updating your local comprehensive plan. And a lot of people who are nervous, but excited, interested in some follow-up to that. And then um, it seems like People are planning to attend our future deep dive sessions. That's great. Obviously, this is the first one on the climate topic, and we have a lot more, um, and we have a lot of great information planned for those upcoming events. So we do hope you attend those. I am going to go to our next question.